everyone. Thanks for joining us for the To Be Continued Book Club. I'm Ms. Melissa from North Regional Library. Today I'd like to share with you the book titled The Friendship War by Andrew Clements. And this book is a nominated book on this year's Louisiana Young Reader's Choice Award. Chapter One, All of Them. Flying from Chicago to Boston by myself hasn't been a big deal, as my dad said it was going to be, but nothing ever is. The second I turn on my phone, it dings with three texts from him. Text me as soon as you land. Your plane should have landed now. Are you all right? So I text him right away. All good, just landed. Love from Boston. Dad worries. He calls it planning, but it's worry. Mom worries less because she knows I don't do dumb stuff, not on purpose. My brother Ben knows that too. Actually, Ben understands me pretty well. I understand him totally, which isn't that hard. He's 15, and he mostly thinks about two things, girls and music. Ben's music isn't rock or jazz or rap. It's marching band, which makes his girlfriend hunt tougher than it needs to be. At least, that's my theory. It's the whole marching with a clarinet while wearing a cowboy hat thing. However, if it hadn't been for Ben's August fan camp, the entire family might be here on the plane with me, and I wouldn't be getting to spend time alone with Grandpa. So hooray for marching band! And if Dad had a little less had been a little less worried, then he and mom probably wouldn't have gotten me my own iPhone a couple of weeks ago. So hooray for dad to worry. Grandpa's waiting right at the end of the walkway from the plane, just like dad told him to. Hey, Grace, welcome to Boston. Hi, Grandpa. You look great. I'm not saying that to be polite or something. When we all came to Massachusetts last summer, it was Grandma's funeral. And back then, Grandpa seemed way too thin and old. He looks much better now. And when we hug, I can tell he's not so skinny anymore. The flight attendant in charge of me looks at Grandpa's license. After he signs a form, we're on the move. Me with my backpack and him pulling my suitcase. Anything in bag baggage claim? Nope. Good. So we're headed for central parking. Unless you're hungry. Dad loaded me up with tons of food. I could survive on leftovers for weeks. That's my son-in-law, the Eagle Scout. Once an eagle, always an eagle. Then he says, hey, did you see that link I sent you about how they're making jet fuel out of vegetable oil? Yeah, I love that. Of all the people in the world, I think Grandpa understands me best. He's a real estate agent, but he likes math and science almost as much as I do. Last week, we swapped texts while we watched an episode of Nova, and for years, he's been emailing me links to news he finds online, like the article about robots that can travel through space and they can keep building new copies of themselves. And they do that for thousands of years until the whole galaxy gets explored. Except 
I can't prove that Grandpa is really into the science stuff. He might be making himself like it because he knows that I like it. Either way, it's pretty great. At the core, Grandpa loads my gear into the trunk. How about you lean back and take a nap? When we get to Burnham, I'll wake you up for some ice cream. And I've got a surprise for you, too. A surprise? What? Not telling. Well, can the surprise come first before the ice cream? That gets a chuckle. Excellent idea. It's so good to hear Grandpa laugh. We get going. But I don't want to sleep. I want to stay awake and talk, especially about Grandma. Except it might be too soon for him to talk about her. It's still kind of soon for me, too. During third and fourth grades, I called her a couple of times every week, and she just let me talk and talk. I could call her about anything or about nothing. And if I ran out of stuff to say, she always had something new to tell me, especially about her garden and all the plants and insects and animals. If Grandma hadn't been so great at describing every little thing she loved, no way would I have gotten into science like I have. Anyway, I know we both miss her which must be a lot different for Grandpa than it is for me. He knew her for so much longer. Compared to him, maybe I hardly knew her at all. It'd be nice to talk, but I got up at 5.30 this morning, and I stayed awake to watch a movie on the plane. Once we reached the highway, the humming tires wiped me out. Where, where are we? I blink and look around, and I remember. The road into Burnham is near the New Hampshire border, and it winds through hills covered with pine and maple trees. We pass old farm houses, most of them white with green or black shutters. There are two apple orchards, then corn and pumpkin fields surrounded by stone walls. Land in Illinois doesn't look like this. The air feels different too. Less humid, sort of crisp, even in the last week of August. Grandpa explained once how the soil here is so rocky that it can't hold moisture the way it does in Illinois. And that got us started on learning about the North American glaciers during the last ice age. We get to town center and Grandpa says, shut your eyes and don't peek till I say. So I close my eyes and then I pretend I've been kidnapped and blindfolded, which is probably a weird thing to do, but it makes my observations seem like they matter. I feel the car go straight and I slow count to 30 before we stop. Maybe a traffic light. Nope, a stop sign. Because we move ahead, then stop, move ahead, stop, and the turn signal is clicking. Okay, so we went 30 seconds at about 30 miles an hour. I do the math and since going 60 miles per hour means traveling one mile per minute, Going 30 miles per hour means going half a mile per minute. And we just traveled half a minute, so we went about one quarter of a mile. Which is what I'll tell the police when I call them with the phone that I cleverly hid in my left sock so they can figure out how to track the kidnappers and rescue me. The car turns left. And I count up to a hundred and fifth 
115 before we slow to a stop and I hear the turn signal again. So almost two minutes at 30 miles per hour, which is one mile. Then it's a sharp right, some bumps and squeaks, and a full stop. Okay, open your eyes now. I'm looking at the gravel parking lot full of tall weeds, and we're next to a long brick building. Up near the roof, there's a painted sign with faded letters, Burnham Mills. I bought this whole place just last week. Isn't it great? Grandpa sounds like Ben after he got his new clarinet. Yeah, it's great. And there's a lot of zip in my voice because I can tell he wants me to love it. But as I'm snapping pictures with my phone, all I'm seeing is a good spot to make a zombie movie or hide a kidnapped girl. The windows on the ground floor of the building are boarded up. The second and third floor windows are mostly broken and the brick walls are covered with graffiti. Cracked granite steps lead up to a gray metal door held shut by a rusted chain and padlock. I love this place. It cost me almost nothing. And by next year, the first floor will be full of nice little shops with beautiful offices and the Riverview condos up above. Before you go home, I'm going to give you the grand tour, but let's head back to Main Street and get that ice cream. It's funny, but I can't remember Grandpa ever doing something like this before. I thought that he just helped other people buy and sell properties. And part of me wonders if he'd be tackling a project like this if Grandma were here. I tell myself this is scientific curiosity, but I know I'm just being nosy. A day at the ocean, a day climbing Mount Monodnik, a morning hike around Boston, and an afternoon at the science museum. Grandpa is definitely back. And that makes me really happy. We've been walking so much that I'm feeling like I'll need a vacation from my vacation. The day before I fly home, we're on the front steps of Grandpa's old building late in the afternoon. He really wants to take me inside the place. Here, put this on. And he hands me an orange horde hat with a headlamp. It's dark in there. Scientifically, I understand that darkness isn't an actual condition. Light is actual and darkness just means no light. Still, I'm not a fan. It's not dark everywhere. Only where the windows are boarded up and in the stairwells and down in the basement. He has about 10 different keys on a string and he's trying to find the one for the padlock on the door. The mill was built in 1849 and along the backside, hmm, that's the Kepshore River. The water turned a huge paddle wheel to make the power. First, it was a carpet mill, then a woolen blanket mill, a cotton mill, a shoe factory, and finally a men's and women's clothing factory, which went out of business in 1946. After that, a printer and some small businesses and artists rented space, but it's been empty for almost 15 years which is why it was so cheap. I'm thinking it would be fine if we just look around the outside of the building, but Grandpa gets the lock open and then hands me a canvas shopping bag. What's this for? In case you find something interesting, you can keep whatever you like. Really? Anything? 
Yep. I own the building and everything in it. I follow him inside. And I'm using my phone, sometimes as an extra flashlight, sometimes as a camera. Right away, I realized that this treasure hunt is why Grandpa wanted me to take the grand tour. He knows I love finding stuff. And the old meal is like a gold mine. The first thing I discover is a solid brass doorknob just lying on the floor inside the meal office. Then I find two wooden bobbins loaded with red and green yarn. Then a giant pair of scissors, a tin box of sewing needles, an iron gear that weighs about five pounds, two old-fashioned fountain pens, a silver thimble, a key ring with nine brass keys, a hammer with a big flat head, and a pair of antique glasses, the kind that pinch onto the nose. After an hour, I feel like I barely started but we've got a dinner reservation at Grandpa's favorite seafood place, so I'm trying to see the whole building before time runs out. It's after five o'clock, and we're up on the third floor, and it's bright and sunny with sparrows and pigeons flying in and out of the broken windows. There's not much to see. About 20 large wooden tables bolted to the floor, and some rusty sewing machines next to the windows. I'm watching where I step. Bird droppings. I point at the doorway on the far wall. Where does that go? Let's look. It's locked, so Grandpa gets out his keys, and it takes five tries to find the right one. I turn on my headlamp and pull the door open. It's a small storage room. Wooden shelves loaded with cardboard boxes, each one about a foot high and a foot wide. I brought, brush off some dust and spider webs and carry a box out into the daylight of the large room. It's heavy. The paper ceiling tape tears away easily, and inside, buttons, plain dark gray buttons, each a little smaller than a dime. I shove my hand deep into the box, grab some, and pull them up to look, just like the ones on top. I bring out another box and open it, and then a third, Nothing but more of the same. Grandpa says, that's a lot of gray buttons. Must be almost 30 boxes. And it's okay if I take some of these, right? Like I said, you can keep whatever you want. I scoop two quick handfuls into my bag, then stop. But really, Grandpa, I'd like to have all of them. He points at the shelves. All of them? Yes, please. What in the world are you going to do with that many buttons? I don't know, but I still want them, if it's okay. Now he's laughing. Sure, why not? Take all of them. Then he looks over the shelves again, thinking, it might be a week or so before I can get them shipped but the boxes should fit onto one pallet. And since you are my one and only granddaughter, I will make it happen. I just wish I could be there to see the look on your mom's face when the load arrives in Illinois. Latching onto these buttons, it's not weird. Not for me. And grandma knows that. And he knows mom will understand too. After all, she's the one who stops the car whenever I spot a garage sale. And grandma, she would have clapped her hands and said, 
perfect. Grandpa has seen my room at home, and now the drawers of my desk are crammed full. Also the top of my dresser, and the tops of my book bookcases, and the win window seals. Actually, every flat surface in my room is loaded, including the floor. Feathers, acorns, a really old calculator, seashells, troll dolls, fake jewelry, rocks and stones, keys, markers and pens, coins, pine cones, paper clips, candles from my birthday cakes, every cord and letter I've ever gotten, old movie tickets, marbles, nails, on and on, and that's just the smaller stuff. I've also got seven large snow globes, nine dark blue glass bottles, a globe of the world from 1941, a slide rule in its own leather case, three plastic crates of vinyl records, a wobbly piano stool, and a couple dozen stuffed animal toys, mostly cats and dogs and penguins, not to mention half a zillion paperbacks and comic books plus three full sets of Encyclopedia Britannica, which I st stacked up into the shape of a big armchair. I have a theory about why I collect so many things, which I don't want to think about now. Actually, I've usually got at least five or six active theories rolling around inside my head, theories about all kinds of stuff. Because whenever I notice something I don't understand, I think of a possible way to explain it. And then I keep track of the facts to test if my theory is right, which is not some new process I invented. It's called the scientific method. Still wanting to own a whole storeroom of buttons, I might need to resist revise my theory about why I love all the things in my room. But I'm not lying to Grandpa. I really don't know why I want all of them. I just do. It feels like an opportunity I shouldn't pass up, like when I found the third set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And Grandpa gets that. He's still chuckling and shaking his head. I look at him in the face. Can I ask a favor? He wipes his eyes with a tissue. Sure. When I get home and I tell mom and dad and Ben about your building and everything, I'm not going to tell them about the buttons. Not till they arrive. So could you not mention them until later? No problem. That's even better. Oh, he's laughing again. Grandpa probably thinks I'm going to keep these buttons a complete secret until they show up in Illinois. But that's not quite true. I'm going to tell one other person in exactly six days on the first day of school. If you've enjoyed the Friendship War, Chapter 1, you can walk, go to any library and check out this excellent book by Andrew Clements. Thank you for joining me for the To Be Continued Book Club. We'll see you next time.